Happy New Week! The curls are popping! And this is day 6 hair by this end of year 2023. I want to see more hair strands shaking at my shoulders before they decide to shrink back up to my scalp. Thank you for watching my videos and growing my channel. I spend lots of time and energy making IG reels with almost forgetting why I wanted to do a YouTube channel. I don't think anybody will remember my deep and thoughtful Instagram posts about hair in 5 years. But YouTube is somehow eternal. This is February the 18th. Valentine's Day has already passed but I find this blouse so cute that I had to recreate the look. I haven't fully recovered from my cold so no time for makeup just my blank panda face. <laughs> Today let's talk more about cleansing surfactants, what ingredients I usually avoid when it comes to buying shampoos. If you still have no clue about different types of shampoos and you don't know what surfactants are, you better pause this video and watch the previous video to learn about origins of shampoo and how it became what we are using today. Or you use the YouTube and Google search bar to enter types of shampoos for free content. It's definitely time that you understand what you're buying to become independent from everybody telling you which brand you should be buying. Organic beauty is always best, but not everyone can afford it and wants to strictly exclude certain ingredients out of their hair care. So it's at least good to know what you can buy as an alternative to reap the best benefits for your hair along a healthy diet. Before we hop into the topic, let me show you my hair strands. Look at how wavy it looks when you stretched it out, but it's really a coily round O shape curl pattern. Did I use new styling products? No, I just used the same styling products I used last week. The hair wash started with oiling my scalp. Now, oiling the scalp is not for everyone. I don't apply it daily. Again, I just do it whenever I wash my hair and there's nothing wrong with it. I won't get a lot of build up just because I put oil in my hair or just because I use a cream based styling product. You don't have to clarify your hair with strong solutions just because of using oils and butters. You have to know what kind of shampoos you're using, you have to know how much you use. And if you wash your hair once a week and if you've put a cream based product or if you've oiled your scalp once a week, it will be fine. But yeah, if you put liters of greasy stuff inside your scalp, which will travel down your hair strands, even though you don't see it, but your pillowcase will tell you, yeah, it, you will need clarifying solutions to get all this gunk out, especially if you only wash your hair once a month. But yeah, I love a good massage and the way I massage my scalp is that my entire wrinkly forehead will be moving around and my entire head. And then I use the water spray bottle aloe vera gel to detangle my hair in tiny sections. I use the regular shampoo and a deep conditioner. It cleanses my hair very well without leaving my hair stripped. I used this mask the first time and I loved it. It foams up so a little goes a long way. After deep conditioning, I made my own clay mask with cowling clay, Russell clay and also Hirsche Wu powder or Foti powder. It is said to prevent grey hair strands when you drink or apply it on hair strands so let's see. I used water and I used apple cider vinegar, organic, I used glycerin and I also always have pH paper on hand to test my do-it-yourself mask. As you know, I love the maximum hydration method and I do a modified version of it. I don't use red egg and avocado mask. Avocados are too expensive, so I'm just going to eat that and this will be transformed into my body and hopefully make it up to my scalp and out of my hair. But. I will not just buy avocado mask and other stuff 
mayo and things we all know people try out for hair growth no food is expensive so know what you're doing and know how effective they are I use three types of shampoos I have a clarifying kind of chelating shampoo it removes chlorine and hot water buildup but it's a very strong shampoo and last year I used it once a week the entire summer autumn and winter just to see what it will do on my hair strands now I use it once a month but I think I'm going to eat even use it less and kind of switch up to once every four months or maybe just twice a year uh, before I started using Olaplex number 4c I didn't really buy strong clarifying solutions what did I use in the past I simply used clay mask mixed with apple cider vinegar I don't know the long-term effects for my hair so I really want to be cautious with using all these strong clarifying shampoos. Now let's get into the topic. Remember, sebum is an oily substance along with additional cream-based products you put on your hair. It cannot be removed by water alone. Oils and water don't mix because the oil molecules attract each other more than water molecules. So they can't be rinsed away with water alone good enough. Surfactants have a water-loving head that is attracted to water and an oil-loving head that is attracted to oil. They bind oily dirt on hair and scalp to rinse them away with a water stream. That's why it makes sense to completely drench your hair in water first before you apply shampoo onto your scalp and hair. Surfactants can be divided into their ionic and non-ionic nature. Anionic surfactants carry a negative charge to the water-loving head, called hydrophilic. They provide a lot of leather and cleansing strength in a shampoo formulation. The most common ones are sulfates. They are the primary cleansing agents in shampoo formulations. If the label doesn't explicitly say it's sulfate-free, check the ingredient list. It will typically have one or several of the surfactants listed in the left box. The right box contains the sulfate-free surfactants. Cationic surfactants carry a positive charge and cling to wet surfaces. They are mostly found in conditioners and softeners. Hair strands have a naturally negative charge, but the more damaged it is, so the higher the porosity, the higher the negative charge. Which means you need to balance it out with positive charges. That's why conditioners and deep conditioners are designed for different special hair needs. Amphoteric surfactants carry both positive and negative charges. They are very mild and have a low cleansing power. You can often find them in baby shampoos or tearless shampoos. They decrease the irritancy of a formulation while increasing and stabilizing the leathering qualities. Non-ionic surfactants have no charge to the water-loving head. The mildest ones are combined with anionic surfactants, also found in baby shampoos. They produce very little foam and act as foam stabilizers and thickeners. Now let's use the previous chart to look into my staple shampoos from the strongest to the mildest. Olaplex number 4C has a blend of anionic surfactants, a blend of amphoteric surfactants and a blend of non-ionic surfactants. This is why a little goes a long way, the cleansing power is strong and the lather is so rich when you wash your hair with it. I still have one third left and shared it with my sisters so you really don't need a lot which is great what will we find in the Rawa classic shampoo it surprisingly only contains one anionic surfactant and one amphoteric surfactant the first lever isn't that rich and 
barely foams up on my hair. The second lever is definitely better if you are a fan of rich foaming sensation. But it cleanses my hair very well so I don't think less foam means less cleansing power. It's about the strength of the surfactants used in a formulation. But the foam it's definitely not the same as the Olaplex number 4C or Innocence Hydrating Cream Hair Bath. It contains a blend of anionic surfactants and one amphoteric surfactant and one non-ionic surfactant. This formulation gives a very rich foam power with the first lever. So here also a little goes a long way. What kind of sulfate free surfactants are there? In a co-wash cleanser I've used in the past. Anionic surfactants, amphoteric surfactants, non-ionic surfactants. Now what do I personally avoid when it comes to shampoo ingredients? I try to avoid ingredients that build up on my hair. I prefer the least amount of residues left on my hair so that conditioners can really do the work they were formulated for and styling products can coat my hair strands properly. I first started being properly aware of ingredients with my second big job in 2015 while doing the maximum hydration method. It was a tedious routine derived from the curly girl method to make wash and goes doable for tight 4C heads who had a hard time clumping their hair thinking it's an act of God or low porosity hair. The creators found out that they needed a proper cleansing step in their routine because the conditioner only cleansing was building up on their hair strands. Since they wanted to stay within the curly girl boundaries, they refused using shampoos and opted for baking soda and apple cider vinegar cleansers along the clay washes to keep their hair strands as build up free as possible to promote natural curl clumping and maximum hydration. Healthy and clean hair strands that are hydrated to the max will clump from roots to ends. That's why it's called the maximum hydration method and I see too many similarities when I hear and see curl experts talk about hydrated hair strands and increasing hydration levels. I still wonder until today why the max hydration ladies simply didn't use sulfate free shampoos or co-wash cleansers because I avoid sulfates where I can. I'm pretty sure these days the formulations are gentler, but I still have horrible memories of my hair and scalp with sulfate shampoos and that's why I avoid them. So if you use sulfate shampoos and don't have issues, good for you, but this is my scalp and I've been living 8 years happily without them. I also avoid silicones when it comes to cleansing my hair, no matter how water soluble they are. The aim of shampoo is to free my hair from any build up coating my hair, so I don't want them in my hair. As simple as that. The only time I can think about using them in a shampoo, conditioner and in styling products is when I need to protect my hair from heat styling, like a very straight blowout or flat ironed hair that we like to call cypress. I also avoid shampoos containing petroleum derived ingredients. Just as silicones I avoid them. I want oils that are small enough to enter my cuticles to some extent, not oils that will sit on the outside of my cuticles to prevent conditioning agents to do their work in the conditioning step. I also avoid certain preservatives and drying alcohols. Remember I'm talking Talking from the max hydration standpoint, which is a modification of the curly girl method. So if you followed the curly girl method rules by heart, you will also likely avoid these goodies here that are in some of my products I'm currently using. So my long term goal is to exclude most of these ingredients while I'm growing my hair out. But if I want to heat style, I will use silicones and everything I need to coat and protect my hair from getting heat damaged. But when it comes to only defining my natural curls or doing twists, and braid outs, I don't need these silicones and mineral oils coating my hair strands. But yes, 
I'm talking for my hair, not for your hair. So <laughs> that's it. I hope my video was helpful. You've got an idea on how shampoos work and you're not afraid using them anymore. Bye bye.